the Raw exclusive pay per view Hell in a Cell is finally upon us, and WWE is pushing this as a quote triple main event. And I have to agree with CM Punk, the main event is the one that goes on last. And we all know Roman Reigns and Rusev will not be going last. So it's debated if Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins or Sasha Banks versus Charlotte will be the pay-per-view that goes on last. One hopes that Sasha Banks and Charlotte because history needs to, this is history making moment and we need to establish that. So anyways, the build up here has been eh Yeah, like Compared to SmackDown, like, okay, the James Ellworth stuff, that, that kind of got annoying for a bit. But, but, like, yeah, SmackDown does better when it comes to storytelling. You can you can thank Ryan Ward for that, since he's from NXT and he knows what to do. But, um, Raw's creative team seems to be more like, oh, we got a new segment coming up. Get dressed. Like, like... It's it's so confusing. Like there's some consistency, but ultimately I don't know what's going on anymore. Like Roman Reigns versus Rusev. Like I'm wondering why isn't Rusev the face here? Because he's defending his wife's honor, his family, and it seems like the U.S. title is not as important, even though he says it is. But it's clearly because he's defending the honor of his wife and family. And yet, Roman Reigns acts like the jackass who who pretty much wants to make Rusev's life miserable. So, yeah. Who's the face here again? But I'll get to that when I get to that. First, let's talk about Enzo and Big Cass versus Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson of the club. What are they doing with the club? Like, ever since the brand split, they've Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson have gotten the worst of this brand split deal. Mostly because AJ Styles is the WWE Champion, and you would expect, oh, well, they're going to be Tag Team Champions. Like, this is part of the club's big expansion. But, like, when Finn, Bal Finn Balor got injured, it seems like all those plans were derailed. Since they were teasing that they were going to do Finn Balor, Balor Club with Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows, and then Finn Balor got injured, and then they had to change their plans... And basically, that means leaving Luke Gallus and Carl Anderson in the cold. So this is your standard basic feud. These two teams, this team attacked another team. This team wants revenge and whatnot. Okay, let's see how this goes. And Carl Anderson and Luke Gallus have been on the brunt end of, of the entire build. Like, they were the instigators, and now they're the, now they're the brunt end of this deal. Like, Enzo and Big Cass keep getting victories over them. They keep getting the dominant victory over them. And it's just... Uh. Like, even Enzo and Big Cass, even when their microphones are shut off by Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows because they paid somebody in the production truck, um, Enzo could and Cass could still keep doing their promo without the microphone, which proves how over they are with the WWE fans. So I'll give them a positive on that, since that was a major highlight. But the other confusing thing is, why is Enzo and Big Cass playing heel tendencies as faces? Like, they keep, like, interfering in matches... Whereas Luke Gallows and Carl Anderson haven't interfered in matches. Like, just attacked people once. And yet, the face commentary is saying, Oh, that, oh that's just making a mark and whatnot. Um, <clears throat> oh, no, that's just making a mark. That's just proving yourself and whatnot. And I'm like, okay, if this was a heel, you'd be saying the exact opposite. Like... This is very hypocritical, Byron, Sa Byron Saxton and Michael Cole. Like, I know you're under force by Vince McMahon. Yeah, I know you're forced to be something you're not. But even you should have acknowledged that, yeah, we should have not. Yeah, they should have done that. But, no, they're faces. Therefore, they need to compliment the faces even if they do heel tactics. I like if this if they were established as anti-heroes, then that could be one thing. But 
even then the commentary team should still have some moral ground here. So, with these two losses and Enzo and Big Cass gave to the club, I'm guessing the club's going to get victory out of this match. But ultimately, you just don't care at this point because, let's face it, they're, they're, they're screwed. Their, their booking has been horrible. It's like, Mystic Man hated the Bullet Club and did it in New Japan Pro Wrestling because he didn't create it. And he's going to take it out on Carl Anderson and Luke Gallows since he can't take it out on AJ Styles because he's too popular with fans. He can thank TNA for that, so he'll try and bury TNA afterwards. So, yeah. Okay, let's move on. New Day... New Day versus the Cesaro and Sheamus duo, and... Okay, why did they go back with the whole Cesaro and Sheamus... The whole, oh, the tag team that hates each other, yet eventually will get along. Like, it worked for Kane and X-Pox, because Kane was trying to be that guy who was trying to get the big monster to come out of his shell. And even Daniel Bryan and Kane, like, there was at least build up to this, not just throw them in there right away and then just have them bicker every single second. Like, don't get me wrong, Kane and Brian bickered a lot, but they at least were they were, like, given real opponents, not just jobbers to beat. Especially Cesar and Seamus. Like, I get that they don't have that many tag team sense, well, the division's been split in half, but... Like, man, I I just don't see how this team's gonna work. Like, it worked for Xbox and Kane. It worked for Daniel Bryan and Kane. Even if I didn't like it, but I could tell it worked. Even though I, it ended up ruining Kane's monster's ways. Like, even if you went back to being a monster, uh, you couldn't take it seriously anymore, in my opinion. But yeah, like. The New Day, once again, they keep bullying Sheamus, and Cesaro says, Oh, hey, it's Cesaro, he's cool with us. And Cesaro and Sheamus during their singles matches with the New Day, they, they kept going on their phone, Facebook Live, and all that. And they kept pointing this out. I, I just woke up. So, <clears throat> Cesaro and Sheamus... Finally get a tag team match with the New Day, and I was wondering why they gave this away on free television since they're gonna have a week since they're just less than a week away till the big match at Hell in a Cell, and they won. And I wasn't surprised by that because like they had to do something to build momentum. Like I was, I was guessing that the best thing to do was that Cesaro and Sheamus would celebrate and then realize what they were doing and then go back to hating each other. And they didn't do that. Like, they like they tried to steal each other's spotlight. Like, I'll give compliment that Cesaro did a vicious European uppercut to Kofi Kingston when he jumped, dived out of the ring. But uh, that's all I can give it. Like, I knew that was going to happen. And, yeah. I don't see Cesaro and Sheamus winning the tag team belts. And the New Day's going to retain it. Like, they keep hiding up demolition. <sighs> <clears throat> they keep building up Demolition's tag team reign and saying like, oh, the New Day is so close. They're so close to breaking the record. And I'm like, okay, yeah, they're breaking the record. Like, someone calculated that it would be in December after Roblox. So, yeah, the New Day, they're going to retain and they're going to keep the belt at least until early next year. So get excited for that. So I say we have more time for promos and Brudio cereal. So yeah. And then afterwards they'll start to splinter down the New Day group and then WWE fans will complain. Even though it lasted for two year nearly two years. Yeah, it's been two years. It's surprising that this fact has kept us long. Now we get to TJ Perkins versus the Brian Kendrick. Okay. Why did Brian Kendrick lose to Rich Swan on the final Raw? Um, that's an honest question. Why did they have him lose? I don't get why. 
But ultimately, like, there have been some backstage interactions with them. Mostly how T.J. Perkins says that Brian Kendrick's no longer the Brian Kendrick he knew. And Brian Kendrick saying that he had to change. And saying he needs to fight for his family and provide for them with that Cruiserweight belt. And saying this is his last chance. So I just basically stunned with this entire build. And I'm trying to wonder, why isn't Brian Kendrick that face who's so desperate to get a victory? To, to win the Cruiserweight Championship. Like, they could have done that. They could have told an underdog storyline with Brian Kendrick. Like, TJ Perkins, like, he wants... To, like, they could have had TJ Perkins be that guy, like, I can't... I can't do the... I can't do the fall for you. Like, I need to... Because I have... I need to prove myself in this ring. So we have to basically be the best... May the best man win. And Brian Kendrick... Like, they were going to do that, I think. And then they just wanted to make him a heel because a guy supporting his family is clearly a villainous thing to do. So, Brian Kendrick is a heel. And also, WWE insulted our intelligence with this build. Like, initially, it was going to be a Cruiserweight rematch for the Cruiserweight title on Raw. Where T.J. Perkins versus Brian Kendrick, and Brian Kendrick ended up with the victory. And I was like, "Is he the new cruiserweight champion?" Because they didn't talk about that. And no, like I distinctly remember that week prior that it was going to be for the cruiserweight title, and now they're saying it's not. So what happened? Okay, you want to insult our intelligence? Fine. This is why SmackDown does better. Like. Pathetic. Shame! Shame! So now we have um, Brian Kendrick getting this desperation move tactic where he's asking TJ Perkins to take the fall and TJ Perkins says no and walks off. So expect something that big happen at Hell in a Cell. I wouldn't be surprised if Brian Kendrick won. <clears throat> but at the same time, we need to have TJ Perkins win because, well, they need to still keep him momentum high with the hat he won the Cruiserweight Classic. And only two months into, and only less than a month into his reign as Cruiserweight Champion, well, that would be just stupid. So I'm hoping that they don't they don't drop the belt to Kendrick, but at the same time, I wouldn't be surprised if Kendrick won. So, we'll just have to wait and see. Now we get to one of our triple main events. Roman Reigns versus Rusev. And I'm still BSing on the whole triple main event. Because the main event is the thing that goes on last. So, like I said, Roman Reigns and Rusev, like, it's confusing. Like, Rusev clearly is the face in this fight. And Roman Reigns is the heel. Like, Rusev's out there defending his wife's honor. He's defending his family. I like Rusev has insulted the Samoan family at times, but ultimately, yeah, like, John Cena insulted the Y family with horrible Photoshop imagery, so, yeah, I, who's really complaining at this point? So, I'm trying to wonder, what's going on with this whole feud? Like, it's just confusing. What should have been this... Roman Reigns is bloodiest, one of Roman Reigns' bloodiest feud, like, since Bray Wyatt. Turned into this confusing mess, like, who's the heel, who's the face in this fight? Because this is kind of confusing. Like, is it Rusev? Like, he's defending his wife's honor, but is it Roman Reigns? Because Dodie tells us to. So, oh, and I also noticed, I think I mentioned this, but I don't know... Like, they remove Roman Reigns' contact lenses, so they're not making him look blue, which is actually an improvement. So, that's a good thing. And Rusev also shaved his mustache, and, and he just looks weird and, and completely different to me. So, I couldn't, so, like, I was like, well, well okay, that, this is weird for me. But moving on, that's just a minor, minor complaint, minor nitpick. But um, I'm hoping this match 
caps off what could have been in this feud, a bloody massacre for either one of them. So I'm hoping for a fight, a brawl of the ages with Roman Reigns and Rusev. And they and like they don't really seem to talk like Roman Reigns did say that he has been inside Hell in a Cell. And I'm thinking like, oh yeah, you were in high side hell in a cell. Um, against that guy. What was his name? He had a long beard. He also had experience in hell in a cell. He intended to play God inside hell in a cell with you. Um, what was his name? It, it, it starts with a B and it ends with Wyatt. Huh. Well, looks like we'll never know. Oh well. Dede, you will never talk about that. We're just too dumb to remember that. So, Rusev has no fear heading into this match, even though Mick Foley should prove that you should. So, yeah. I can't wait what's going to happen with Roman Reigns and Rusev. I'm, it will probably be the third best match, since they have two other Hell in a Cell matches they need to compete with. This won't steal the show like it did last time for Roman Reigns at Hell in a Cell. So, expect that. Now we get to Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. And you know who I'm talking about last. Kevin Owens and Seth Rollins, like... And you can also, to an extent, add Chris Jericho to that. Since this is going to turn into a handicap match, most likely, at Hell in a Cell. With Chris Jericho somehow getting involved... Either as a special referee, since that was rumored, or just breaking into the cell and getting involved. Yeah. Um, what should be a very serious use, since this is taking place inside Hell in a Cell, has turned comedic. Why? Even John Cena took it seriously when he entered Hell in a Cell. To an extent. Like, Seth Rollins is saying sparkle crotch and whatnot. And, like, oh, God, they're doing it. I'm like, they're really doing it. They're, they're giving him cheesy promos like they did with River Reigns. Like, please don't tell me Vince wrote those lines. If he did, I, I'm quitting. I, I'm going to just watch SmackDown full time. So, yeah. Not really. I, I just... Because I need to also talk about Survivor Series soon. And there's all these raw pay-per-views they're doing. But, uh, yeah. Kevin Owens has also, like... Okay, like, Chris Jericho's been on the receiving end of this of this feud. Like, he's the one getting targeted. Like, they did the list. And if the day came that a material object was more popular than Roman Reigns, I was like... Oh, dear God. Like, I get it, it's Chris Jericho, but, like, it's just a list. I mean, like, it's funny, it's entertaining, the whole, you just made the list. But, it's a list. Like, I couldn't believe how over this got with fans. Like, there were parodies of it on Twitter, I'm pretty sure on Facebook. There were fans chanting, where's the list? Where's the list? Where's the list? And then you have to also account for Stephanie McMahon and Triple H getting involved, probably. So you have three factors into this match. Kevin Owens, Stephanie McMahon, and Chris Jericho. Triple H, I don't know yet. So, so, the, so Rollins has a lot of stacked against him. And it's for the Universal Championship, bleh. And once more, I'm pretty certain Kevin Owens is going to retain. It'd be stupid to just drop the belt already. Like, it's already been reported that it's going to be Kevin Owens versus Brock Lesnar at Royal Rumble. So, that takes away the tension on that. I'm just hoping for a good match. And considering who these guys are, I'm ex it's almost guaranteed. Unless WWE restricts them, then I'll complain about it on the internet. So, I don't know what's going to happen with Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. Like, there's so many factors going into this match. Like, how many interferences are they going to have? How many overbooking are they going to have? Is Kevin Owens going to drop the belt to Seth Rollins? 
Okay, that last part was a lie. So, we won't know until we see. Now we have what should be the main event. Not a triple main event. Sasha Banks vs. Charlotte inside Hell in a Cell for the first time ever for women wrestlers. Yep, that, that literally happened. Sasha Banks and Charlotte are going to enter Hell in a Cell as the first two women ever. That's something Lita and Tristan never got a chance to do, and that would have been awesome. They main event Raw for the first time ever, especially being the first ever women to main event Raw on their own. But to main event, probably, to possibly main event a pay per view? To possibly main event to take place inside Hell in a Cell? That would have been awesome! Like, could you imagine Lita and Trish considering the bad blood they have in, in their feuds? Like, not in real life, but in their feuds? So, yeah. Yeah, it'd be kind of awesome. So, anyway, Sasha Banks and Charlotte, like, Sasha Banks had a match against Charlotte on Raw earlier this month, and Dana Brooke was eliminated. Like, I was expecting Dana Brooke and Bailey to get announced for this match, maybe later this week. And that feud has been a disaster. And anyways, but Sasha Banks and Charlotte, they're going to have a big feud soon. They're having this big match, and they had a match on Raw, where Sasha Banks regained the women's title. And Charlotte, once again, looked like she was going to break down, but has but had a held up head, held up in pride. Like she, like she was going to get back. But, um... Yeah, like, they keep highlighting Eddie Guerrero and, like, Charlotte, Ric Flair, Sasha Banks, Eddie Guerrero. Like, they're not related, I get that. But, um, it's like, it's more like, imagine if Eddie Guerrero versus Ric Flair actually ha had happened. I think it did on Raw once. I It's been so long, I kind of forgot. But... It, it just seems like that to me. Like, it seems like they're trying to imagine what would it be like if Eddie Guerrero versus Ric Flair happened if they were in their prime. And if they were, and if Eddie was still around, God bless his soul. So, Sasha Banks and Charlotte had this hell of a match on Raw for the women's title, and they made an event in Raw when Trish and Lita be proud. So... Yeah. Um, along with that, Sasha Banks also has been keeping her track record great, and they highlighted her injuries in the in the year in the past year this year, and it's almost surprising. Like three times she's been injured. Like one was a concussion, one was a back injury, one was almost a back injury again. I forgot what the third one was, like, uh, I, uh, yeah, these Johnnies are going to possibly annoy my viewers. So, I was surprised they mentioned her injuries, like, they, like, I'm surprised Charlotte didn't even call her injury prone, so telling her, why are you stepping foot inside hell in a cell if you're this easy to get injured? Would be surprised would have been surprising, but they didn't do that. Mostly because you would need Vince McMahon there to write the whole the whole thing. But I'm pretty sure Triple H has been writing this feed for them. So um, I'm hoping, hoping this match steals the show and is the main event. The match that goes on last, Vince. It's the match that goes on last, not a triple main event. No matter how many times you push it down our throats. And along with that, during their contract signing, Shasha and, Sh and Charlotte said that they would not be afraid to step inside Hell in a Cell. Yet yeah, McFoley cut, cut this impassioned speech talking about how they should be afraid since this is the structure that nearly crippled him for life. And how he's always in pain for, for the rest of his days. And suffering from nerve damage and hip sockets and... Uh, how bone is rubbing on bone, which has to be excruciating. You can ask Scott Hall on that. 
and it's yeah, I had to understand like they sh like there should be some hesitation heading into this match. Like this is the first time ever for women, and Shasta Banks is also it has three injuries on her track record this year alone. Charlotte, this is her first time as well in this match. And rumors had it that she wanted that she asked court management to do a moonsault dive off the top of the structure. I never found a source on that. I just heard someone talk about that, and I said, "Okay, even I know that would be a stupid idea. Like as awesome that would be, there's a lot of things that could go wrong with that. Like it's already risky enough diving off the cell, like Shane McMahon did, but to do a Dive like that, that would... Okay, you would have to have luck on your side. So, yeah. I don't know what's going to happen. I'm hoping this match goes on last. And I cannot wait for pay this pay-per-view, despite its lackluster build-up for overall and confusing build-up. And along with that, like I said, triple main event. I call bullshit on that. Mostly because there is no triple main event. The main event is the match that goes on last. The main event is the one that everyone pays their money to see. Well, that's not technically true anymore. There's a lot of matches people pay to see. Like, TJ Perkins versus Brian Kendrick. Roman Reigns versus Rusev. Kevin Owens versus Seth Rollins. But everyone wants to see Shasha and Charlotte go on last. Because they earned that. Like... As much as WWE, and specifically, I mean, Kevin Dunn and Spence McMahon like to say, oh, we made history. We are making history with these women. No, Triple H made history with these women because he gave them the opportunity down in NXT to main event shows. He gave them the opportunity to make history of Iron Women matches. He gave them the opportunity to get on the main roster and have him have control over them to an extent. So... Really, who made history with these women? Who Who's the booker? I know it's not Vince, because that would be too intelligent. And I know it's Kevin, and it's not Kevin Dunn, because he hates anything Triple H creates. So, yeah, I give credit to Triple H on this one. Because he's given these women the opportunity to make history, and I hope he has enough influence to make them go on last. So, but we'll have to wait till Sunday for that. Well, everyone, this was my thoughts on the Hell in a Cell buildup. This was Neo Reality Entertainment. Feel free to like, comment, subscribe, and donate to two for more.